Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on reducing the cost of education and maximising family incomes. Thanks very much for joining us today. I'm absolutely delighted to see that we've got over 150 people signed up for the webinar, which I think is testimony to the level of commitment to the child poverty agenda and also interest in the role that education can play in that. Before we get started, just some housekeeping. I'd like just to remind you that this webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available online for you to forward and share with colleagues afterwards. Secondly, if you have any questions or, or thoughts that you want to share, please use the, the questions tab to, to type those out and we'll come back to them once everyone's finished their presentations. Likewise, if you have any sound issues or technical problems, if you use the question tab um, to let us know that and Lynn Sharp, who is the the technical mastermind behind the webinar, she'll do her best to sort those out for you. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hannah McCulloch and I'm the National Coordinator for Local Child Property Action Reports with the Improvement Service. Um, I job share that role with Rebecca Spillan um, and that role involves supporting local government and health boards with the implementation of their local child poverty action reports and sharing good practice around what can be done to tackle child poverty across the three main drivers of poverty, so income from employment, income from social security and the cost of living. And if you'd like any more information about the support available, um, then please just send me an email or visit the child poverty page of the Improvement Service website. So clearly we're operating in an extremely challenging time for low-income families and it's hard not to be painfully aware of how COVID has revealed and exacerbated long-standing inequalities across Scotland, not least for, for children and young people, and left us with a real mountain to climb in terms of reducing child poverty. But I genuinely think that the work going on across Scotland to tackle the cost of the school day is something that we can be really positive about. What's clear from the projects we'll be discussing today is that there is scope to make a huge difference to families in the short term by removing cost barriers to education and taking some of the, the stress out of family life. Um, and in the long term, by, by fostering a sense of trust and inclusion at school that will no doubt contribute to increased well-being, attainment and, and better life chances in, in the years to come. And we really couldn't ask for a better range of speakers to showcase just what can be done and the difference that it can make Today, we have Sarah Spencer from the Child Poverty Action Group, who will introduce the Talking About Cost and Money at School resource, which was recently launched in partnership with the National Parent Forum for Scotland. We then have Gary Devine from Glasgow City Council, and he'll be giving a, an overview of the, the FISO role, which is the Financial Inclusion Support Officer role that's working ac across Glasgow schools to help ensure families are accessing all their financial entitlements. After that, we have Audrey Sutton and Councillor Robert Foster from North Ayrshire, and they'll be highlighting the activity of the Cost of the School Day Working Group, which is taking a whole systems co-production approach to reducing the cost of education across North Ayrshire. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Sarah Spencer. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Tana. Um, hello everyone. Um, thanks for, for being here today. Um, talking about costs and money at school is a cost of the school day resource and an animation which is designed to help with better communication with families um, when it comes to school costs, money worries and financial entitlements and support. Um, really importantly, it's based on the experiences and the suggestions of parents and carers across Scotland. Um, there's nothing in the resource and nothing I'll tell you today that doesn't come from parents and carers' perspectives. And it's action based on what they're clearly telling us that will help to achieve what's in the title of this webinar, um, reducing the cost of learning and maximising family incomes. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So we know that talking about costs and money can feel quite tricky um, and that's the reason we wanted to look at this in the first place. Um, in our work with schools and, and just general contacts and carers, 
um, we often hear about the challenges and the stresses and the frustrations that are there around money worries and school costs that are that are difficult to meet. Um, what we're always struck by is a, a sort of big barrier that's there for parents who are having a difficult time but are feeling unable to raise that with their schools. Um, sorry, if you can just click the slide. Yeah, brilliant, thanks. Um, in this survey that we ran to inform this resource, um, we asked parents how it felt approaching schools with, uh, with their schools with costs and money concerns. And you can see here some of the, the many, many responses that we got that are sort of really honest and, and really quite distressing. Um, people said it made them feel guilty, ashamed, embarrassed, degraded, uncomfortable, judged, afraid. Really, really powerful feelings um, that were leading to frustration and pressure and, and silence. People weren't doing it. Um, and we were also really aware of a barrier from the other side. Um, we, we often hear teachers and other school staff saying, we don't want to stigmatise families. We don't want to offend them by offering help that's not needed. We don't want to offer it in the wrong way. You know, there are that many students in the school that, that, school that have, have money issues. Um, lots of different things like that. And that means that lots of schools aren't necessarily talking about costs and money either. Um, if you could click again. But in the survey, um, we also had these sort of responses um, from parents who had had much better experiences. And obviously we've come across loads of schools that are doing this really brilliantly. So we wanted to dig into that a wee bit more. These are schools that are getting communication right around costs and money, but what were they actually doing? And, you know, ultimately, how can we all get from the left hand side of this slide with the guilt and the shame and the silence to this other side with all these really great things happening? Uh, next slide. So we ran a survey with um, National Parent Forum of Scotland to find out more. We heard from over 1,800 parents and carers um, in almost every local authority area. Um, many of them were on low incomes or worried about money. Um, that's unsurprising, um, you know, as, as Hannah's um, already mentioned. Even before COVID, a quarter of all children were living in poverty in Scotland, most of them in working households. Um, the most recent local estimates show child poverty rates rising in every local authority area. And we know the terrible impact that COVID has had on family finance last year. Um, in the survey, what parents told us fell really clearly into five key steps that we built the resource and the animation around. Um, so I'll show you the animation now on the next slide. Talking about money can be difficult. If you've just gone without something so your kids don't, it might be the last thing you want to think about. But if everyone knew the difference that talking about costs and money makes, it would change lives. Every penny and pound matters to some families. We could all start by being more aware of real life problems and let families know that everyone needs help at times. When letters and emails acknowledge how many families are struggling, it can be reassuring. Don't assume families are okay financially. Instead, show everyone that you are aware of hidden poverty and explain the support that's out there so nobody gets missed. We really notice when schools do things to take the pressure off. When staff are approachable and understanding, it makes us feel relaxed and able to talk. And when families feel good, children feel like they fit in and are ready to learn. And that's what it's all about. We just want our kids to be happy at school. And when all of this happens, we feel we are not alone. Okay, and just the next slide, thanks. Great, thank you. So these are the five main areas, the five key steps from parents' perspectives. Poverty awareness, leadership and visibility, making no assumptions and letting everyone know, tackling the cost of the school day and making space for conversations. I'm gonna give a really quick summary of these today. 
Um, and, um, you know, please do look at the resource after this because there's loads more detail and information in there and also some brilliant case studies of schools who are getting communication right for families. Um, we've got a FISO case study in there and also a school from North Ayrshire, um, which, um, you know, you'll hear lots more about um, later today. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so step one, um, being poverty aware. Parents were really clear that they wanted their schools to understand financial difficulties so that they could be mindful of that in, in what they were planning and delivering. Report around it could be appropriate. Um, parents said they wanted their schools to understand the really difficult day-to-day -day challenges um, that families on low incomes are facing. Um, they wanted them to understand the impact that requests for money have on them, on their children, on their budgets, on their well-being. Um, that there are lots that there are lots of them struggling with money, but maybe not eligible for support, and that financial circumstances might have changed recently with COVID, and they might need more information and support. Parents said that knowing their schools understood all of that would go a really long way to overcoming those sort of fearful, embarrassed feelings that I mentioned before. Next slide. Step two, leadership and visibility. Um, parents say that an open and proactive approach from their schools in talking about costs and money is important. Um, taking a really straightforward, matter-of-fact style in communication, whether it's written or face-to-face, -face, one that makes clear that financial difficulties can happen to anyone in the school community, and we're keen to help in a discreet, confidential, kind way. Strong and visible leadership on why this is the right thing to do, why it's important, why it's relevant for the whole school, parents said that would help them feel more confident and comfortable. Next slide. Okay. Um, step three, making no assumptions and telling everyone. Um, it can be really easy to make assumptions about income is an affluent area, or maybe nobody's complained about costs. But parents really strongly said that wrong assumptions about this meant asking families for money they couldn't afford pressure on them. Information about financial support wasn't reaching all of the families who need it. And if it's sort of only everyone's fine money-wise, then it's going to be really hard for parents to approach their schools for support if they need it. Okay, next slide. Parents said, tell everyone about entitlements in a clear, jargon-free way, which doesn't other them by talking about, you know, disadvantaged families, those in need, PEF children, kind of phrases like that, which were really putting families off and information that's provided at the right time. So transitions, inductions, start of the year, every term, and in advance of application deadlines. And they said, if there is help there with school costs, make that clear what help there is from who and how you get it, because it's not always clear. Um, and it's, it's very off-putting um, asking about this while not knowing if anything exists. So all of that means information getting to families who need it, and it's part of that open, proactive approach that reduces stigma and opens the door to further conversations. Next slide. Tackling the cost of the school day. Parents, particularly those on low incomes, said that they notice when their schools are doing things to take the pressure off. Um, you can see just a you know, handful of the brilliant things schools are doing on the slide here. Parents said they wanted their schools to think about affordability when planning, give lots of notice, and to know that costs don't ever really feel optional to them. If you're putting opportunities out there, children want to do them, and there's the potential that families who can't afford them will be under pressure. Okay, next slide. And really importantly, parents said that the more schools do regularly, visibly, straightforward, reduce costs and communicate about financial support with everyone, 
the more they feel like their schools understand and care about what's going on, the more they feel their school has their backs, something that can only benefit relationships and, and everyone's experience at school. Next slide. And finally, making space for conversations. Parents said information sharing needs to be universal to reach everyone, but for actual conversations, the important things are discretion, confidentiality, and careful approaches. Making it straightforward to contact staff, giving options of how to do that, telling people what they can expect. All of these things helps to lessen anxiety for parents. And then following conversations, parents said they wanted their schools to take care in how support is provided um, to avoid children feeling embarrassed or singled out by targeted support. Um, a really good way to work out what's needed, how support can be best provided is unsurprisingly by asking your school community. And there, there's lots of resources to do that in the Cost of the School Day toolkit um, to know what's right for your own particular setting. Next slide. Okay, so there we go. That was a hopefully really quick dash through the five steps. Um, there's loads more practical details and examples of how to do this um, actually in the resource. So please, if you do anything following this session, have a proper look at it, share it with colleagues. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so just to close, I just wanted to say the messages from parents on what they want. When when it comes to communication, and it couldn't have been clearer in the survey. And actually, lots of the things I've mentioned, lots of the things in the resource are quite straightforward. There's lots of simple and doable actions that you can take away and implement tomorrow. And I hope I've got across why that's important to do and the benefits it could have for, for children and families. And just the last slide. Um, yeah, just on the last slide there, links to resources on our website and an email address if you want to get in touch with, with any questions after this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. That was fantastic. And if anyone has any questions for Sarah, please use the, the question tab at the, the side of your screen. Uh, we're now going to hand over to Gary Devine from Glasgow City Council to talk about the FISO project. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Devine, and I'm the lead officer in the financial conclusion team at Glasgow City Council and the project manager for the financial conclusion support officer project. Next slide, please. Glasgow City Council are currently running a financial conclusion support officer project aimed at embedding financial inclusion support into a school setting. The foundations of this project were very much based on listening to parents and community groups with lived experience of poverty and using the data the Council has to identify gaps and needs in service. This need for a different approach to supporting parents and families was highlighted when we had discussions with and listened to those parents at a local level who were telling us of their difficulty in understanding and claiming educational benefits. This understanding of these issues led us to look at some of the financial supports we already had in place, and data from our mainstream financial inclusion services told us that 60% of the clients using these services did not have children. And indeed, coupling this data from clients making applications to the Scottish Welfare Fund, 67% did not have children. This confirmed that families with children were not accessing financial inclusion assistance as much as they should be. Around this time, early work in understanding the depths of child poverty in Glasgow with our colleagues at the Centre for Civic Innovation in Glasgow led us to compare real income data taken from the Housing Benefit and Council Tax Reduction System with ed education benefits data held in the CMIS system to chart out uptake of educational benefits across the city, right across each of the schools all the way through. Before starting this analysis, we obviously needed to have agreement to use the CMIS data from education services. And coincidentally, we were already having discussions with colleagues in education driven by feedback from our mentors, parents, and young people through our MCR Pathways programme around specific issues families had highlighted in relation to applying for education maintenance allowance. These discussions allowed the conversation to be opened up to look at other analysis of all education benefits. And we moved quickly from being colleagues assisting each other to forming a strong partnership with a joint view of narrowing gaps and take up. 
Next slide, please. Our aim is to look at new ways to tackle child poverty, aimed at targeting the three main drivers of child poverty, the cost of living, maximising entitlement from social security benefits and income from employment. At the outset, we knew that parents and families were not engaging with mainstream financial services as much as they should be. So we were keen to learn from what we had done in the past through main, the mainstream approach and that we did not want this to be just another FI outreach. We really wanted a true partnership of all involved between the teams at local authority level and our partners from the third sector to present an education-led and provided service to parents and families in an environment that they trusted they were already visiting and engaged with. As mentioned, this is very much education-centred in that the advice by a named financial inclusion support officer is taken to parents by the schools, initially using the Support for Families booklet, which was a short booklet created based on that feedback from parents with lived experience of poverty, advising parents of some of the grants and benefits that they may be entitled to throughout the educational lifetime of their children and young people. In addition, engagement with the Financial Inclusion Support Officer is encouraged by the schools using school social media platforms and group call facilities throughout the individual schools. The primary purpose of this project is to support families and alleviate poverty by providing one-to-one -one support for parents and families up to and including type three support in the fields of welfare rights and debt reconciliation. To, ha to enhance this offer, New direct referral pathways have been introduced to further strengthen the focus on reducing child poverty through the main drivers. Next slide, please. A new direct referral pathway to employability support has been introduced. Sorry, my correction cut there for a second. Sorry, I was saying a new direct referral pathway to employees about employability support has been introduced, offering parents access to training and education, help to start their careers, or move towards better paid employment. And based on the feedback of parents and partners, we've also introduced digital digital supports in recognition of digital exclusion and the barriers it presents not only in terms of employment, but also in reducing the cost of living by giving parents experiencing poverty more of a level playing field in the basics of using digital means to lower their bills. And a prime example of this would be to use comparison websites. The digital pathway offers a digital device and 12 months MiFi if needed. There's also the added option of digital support and training. In addition to the employability and digital supports, we have also made fuel support and advice available. This includes access to advice on fuel tariffs and top-ups and assistance to set up realistic budget plans with providers. Next slide, please. The project is now in its second phase. Phase one was a 12-month pilot in which one financial inclusion support officer worked with four schools to test the service and methods of engagement used to invite parents into the service. As we were approaching the end of the first year pilot, an opportunity arose through Scottish Government's Assessing Future Needs COVID emergency funding to extend and expand the project for a further 12 months into a second phase. We've been able to increase the number of financial inclusion support officers from one up to nine, and considering the resource, we are aiming to deliver the service to all 30, 30 secondary schools in the city. To test future potential provision, we are also engaging with two primary schools and one assisted learning school in the city. Collaboration and partnership working with all involved has been key in the project, from listening to parents and families, listening to partners in education services, teachers and schools, and our partners in the financial inclusion agencies in the third sector. The ability to share data and feedback on an ongoing basis and have a flexible approach to not only the services being provided, but how they are being provided at different schools has meant that the project is constantly evolving to try and stay ahead of the curve in that important aim of engaging families with the advice and assistance they need. We believe the project and the pilot have been reasonably successful, and I can share some of the outcomes with you. Next slide, please. 
So during the, the, the first pilot phase, which ran from February 2020 to February 2021, 790 families engaged with the service. Of the 790 families, 257 of these families are now in a better off financial position, with financial gains recorded of £715,000. You can see there a, a brief spread across uh, those financial gains recorded. 71% of those were in welfare benefits, 18% in education benefits, 6% in disability benefits, and 5% spread across others that the financial inclusion officers can access. Now, along with the, the feedback from parents and families and schools, when we look at this 71% of, of welfare benefits claimed, this led us to change some of the promotional materials we used. Early engagement in the pilot phase uh, looked at us trying to get parents into the service using the, the, the educational benefits that's available and reducing that, that cost to the school day. Again, based through that, the, on that feedback from parents, we've realised that COVID over the last year has hit many families and that they're now having to apply for welfare benefits that they may not have had to apply for before. Equally, we also found that as the success of the, the project worked and we signed up more families to education benefits, to use that promotional material no longer worked for us in engaging those families. So we're now basing a lot of new promotional materials about uh, welfare benefits, about debt advice, and it's leading us to get more parents and families into the service. Next slide, please. The early outcomes for our phase two are that 294 further families have engaged with the service. Uh, this, uh, these, these outcomes are measured between the 1st of March and the 31st of May this year. And of those 294 families, 171 families are in a better financial position. It's, again, approximately £228,000 in financial gains. What we have noticed this time round, and again, it will be part of that is, is based on listening to that feedback from schools, and that change in promotional material is the amount of debt that the, the financial inclusion support officers are now managing has increased greatly. In the whole of uh, our phase one, we had £41,000 in debt managed. Uh, already in the first quarter of phase two, we're up at £96,000. That phase two, we've added a further 11 schools that, that contribute to these figures that you're looking at just now. In addition to the financial gains in our new phase since March, we've also now issued 44 digital devices to parents and families through our digital referral pathway and engaged 15 parents with our employability supports. Indeed, we recently worked with one family who advised us of difficulties their children had with the distance to school after a house move and requested bikes of the service. So we worked with a local organisation in Glasgow to provide bikes for the children which has now led us into another area of support to consider and attempt to provide across the whole programme. I would like to say a many thanks to Hannah and the team for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, and I believe there'll be some time at the end for any questions you may have. If, if you don't have uh, any, any today and you think of some later, Hannah has my details and, and she can certainly pass them on to you. Thanks very much, everybody, for listening. Thanks very much, Gary. That's fantastic. Um, just well, as I've said, we'll move through the speakers and then there'll be time for questions at, at the end. So next up we have Councillor Robert Foster and Audrey Sutton from North Ayrshire Council. Just hand over to them just now. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Hannah, and thanks for in, inviting us along today um, to speak at this, this webinar. Um, I'm Councillor Robert Foster. I'm the Cabinet Member for Health and Social Care and the, the kind of lead member for poverty um, at North Ayrshire Council, and um, Audrey Sutton is going to speak after me. Um, she's the executive director for uh, communities and education. I think where a good place to start would be probably the last part of the, the title that's on the screen. So um, last summer we decided that we would have a bit of a, a reshuffle within the kind of um, the political sphere of the, the administration, and we decided that we needed a, a bit of a leadership around um, tackling poverty. Um, North Ayrshire is an area with um, some really um, high areas of social deprivation. 
high levels of poverty, really low job uh, job density. Um, so that, that has to be a focus for um, not only the council but partners going forward. So that was a kind of first step to to, to that was putting a, a bit of politics behind it, um, which I think is is actually really helped. Um, in terms of um, cost of the school day, the kind of that's we're building on from the kind of national work. Sarah spoke a bit about it as well, and um, Sarah's been a, a, a great help to us in North Ayrshire in terms of developing um, this this work and, and, and pushing it along as well. So Sarah should definitely be one of the busiest people in Scotland after this webinar because you should all be tapping on door and, and asking for a bit of help. But um, so we were determined in North Ayrshire that um, the time was right to, to build on the kind of national work that had been done, push some of the the, the boundaries. Um, locally, um, and try and remove some of those barriers um, around about um, the cost of the school day, um, under, when understanding that um, the school might be free, education might be free, but there's definitely costs attached, and that can be a real struggle um, for some families. In terms of what we we when when we started this journey, we we had a conversation about um, how we would take it forward, the kind of process of it, who we wanted involved, that kind of thing. And one of the, the early things that we recognised was that a lot of this wouldn't be about reinventing the wheel. So there was very good stuff going on um, at different schools within the local authority area, primary school and high school level. So part of the work was about bringing what's been going on at certain schools and widening that out to the whole um, school. Um, community. So for example, one of our um, uh, high schools had a really good um, kind of clothing bank for, for families to reuse um, the kind of school uniforms and stuff like that. So making sure that that's rolled out that kind of approach. So um, that was the kind of first part of the, the work. But in terms of the, the kind of clothing stuff, the interesting thing, the discussion that we had around that was about kind of maybe moving the conversation away from donating uniforms in a kind of poverty sphere, but actually donating them as a way of um, the environmental agenda. Um, so it's a big kind of policy initiative for um, the council. But our young people are also very interested in, in the, the environment and climate change and stuff as well. So actually, kind of spinning that around a wee bit um, has made them kind of think about it in a, a very different way. Why would you throw clothes away when they can be reused um, as part of the kind of environmental aspect? So that's kind of just one wee kind of um, example. But there's a, there's loads and loads of them within the actual report. Itself. So, in terms of the, the 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 process, how we're going to do this, we were we've got like youth participation strategies, and youth uh, community participation, and stuff like that. So, we we know that we we didn't want to just do this in isolation in terms of as councillors and officers. So, we brought together a, a cost of the school day working group, um, and this included um, young people, our pupils, like um, MSYPs, and um, we had teachers and parents and school staff, elected members. Council officers and also like um, partners from um, other uh, public bodies and third sector and stuff like that as well. Because as Audrey will, will, will talk you through, this is that there has to be a kind of a whole system approach to to tackling poverty, and we want to do that with our cost of school day work as well. And our partners have made a commitment to um, to work with us on that as well and do what they can, um, because we can see that there would be a benefit for. For them in doing that as well, um, so the, the the group itself, the report that, that that came out of this in terms of the, um, the the action plan and what we're going to do next and stuff, this this was devised by the young people, by the school staff, the parents and stuff like that as well. It's their report, um, so it's their experience, their lived experience, and I think that's really really important going forward because we can sometimes get into this you know, policy I headspace where, where we think we're doing the right thing, but we don't actually talk to the people who are who are loving it, and that's been really powerful for us. Um, as, as, as you see going forward in this presentation. So the policy commitments that the, the Cost of the School Day Working Group came up with, um, our cabinet has agreed them and says absolutely this is what we're going to be, be focusing on. Um, and we held our first annual, uh, annual conference a couple of weeks ago, which was a real success. So it was we had we weren't actually sure how it was going to go given that it's online and how many people were going to turn up and that kind of thing. But we got almost a hundred people there for over two hours. It was scheduled to be two hours. Um, but we actually ran over because there were so many questions and people wanted to speak and stuff like that as well. And that's, so that's been a real success. And we held that to try and get a kind of um, a kind of feel from from the people that attended whether the report has, is right. Is it, are we focusing on the right things? Are we going in the right direction? And the feedback we've got um, has been great so far. And we're just kind of kind of working our way through that in terms of what our, our next steps will be. And we're going to hold a, a, a not another conference just for. Um, young people, just for children, young people and pupils to come along and, and, and talk to us about their experience. But I'll pass over to Audrey. But I think one of the things that, that 
that um, has become clear to us is that this isn't going to be solved in one year. So it's not about producing a report and then for the next 12 months we'll do something and then that's it, we're going to forget about it. So um, it's an ongoing piece of work. We've put some money behind it. We've put a recurring pot of half a million pounds um, behind this work to, to, to fund what needs to be funded. Um, but we're also, the, the conference is going to be annual um, and the reports will be annual. So we're keeping going the work. It's not going to be a one-off piece of work and then we can move on to something else. So it's going to take us a bit of time, I think, to 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 get where we need to be and where we would want to be in terms of driving down that cost of the school day. And I think it's important to recognise that there is, it isn't a quick fix. Uh, but I will leave it there. Um, and again, thanks to Hannah for inviting us along and I'm happy to take questions when, if, if there is any, but I'll pass over to Audrey Sutton who will go into a lot more detail. Thanks very much. Thanks, Robert. That certainly set me up well to, to say a bit more about this, but you've you've covered a lot of it. Um, could we move the slide on, please, Anna? Thank you. Now, I don't know how clear that is to everyone, but as Hannah said, she would circulate the slides round and we can um, see it in more detail. So what I wanted to share with you today, I suppose, was just um, the crystallisation, really, of our thinking. And I can't um, reiterate enough what Robert said about the support we've had from Sarah. Um, it's just been amazing. And I think that has enabled us, hopefully, to take our thinking around cost of the school day onto the next level. So co-production is a, a very current theme. Um, in, in North Ayrshire, we pride ourselves in that being really kind of uh, the, the way we work. So the cost of the school day work based on, for example, our local outcomes improvement plan and all of the work that's been consistent with that around community and school empowerment, um, around capacity building and around that understanding of um, the lived experience of people with poverty. So we have a, a fair for all um, Poverty Truth Commission in North Ayrshire, but we also have a Young People's Fair for All Commission. So you can see the coming together there of the voices of families, the voices of, of young people and their friends around that. So we've tried to use all of the tools in our toolkit to, I suppose, provide something which everyone can buy into here. So the working group developed the draft of the Coast of the School Day pledges and commitments, and that became the focus for our conference launch a couple of weeks ago. And as Robert said, what we're now doing is we um, are working through an action plan which is consistent with the commitments, but which puts real um, meat in the bones. So we had a very well developed action plan previously, but what we've wanted to do this time is to ensure that the right voices are heard around the prioritisation of that. So in terms of our commitments, we wanted to keep them fairly simple. Um, Sarah spoke quite compellingly about stigma and she also spoke about leadership and I think Robert positioned that really well for us because essentially that political and, and you know not party political but that just that political leadership of Robert and his colleagues across the council have enabled us to have buy-in and visibility of this and I think that will lead to increased transparency in what happens in schools and with partners but it will also lead to increased uh, consistency. So our commitments there, just very quickly, so clearly the key one is reducing costs related to going to school. And again, that sustainable whole systems approach. And we've been very clear about that. I'm sure you're all the same. It's how we bring all of the levers and drivers in to support us. And we spoke about, you know, people who are involved. We also have our local um, council and partner business teams involved, as well as our third sector organisations, because one of the things that's become clear to us around this work is businesses do want to help. And through the pandemic, as you will know, local businesses played a blinder, frankly, in terms of supporting their local communities. And what we want to do is to give them um, a single door, if you like, into the council so that they can help to reduce the cost of the school day in a way that actually has a kind of ongoing impact. So secondly, we want to increase participation by children, young people and families in designing the school day and related costs. And that's the participation piece. We've just published our new um, youth participation and citizenship strategy, and that very clearly will play a central role in all of this. Um, thirdly, we want to minimise income and stigma 
our increased our inclusive approaches to how we redesign the costs of the school day. And you'll see there um, that one of the things we want to do is ensure that our, our school services and partners take a reflective and poverty aware and inclusive approach to making decisions that affect the cost of the school day. So, for example, within that work, we've already, um, and, and the Assistant Director of Public Health has previously chaired our Chief Officers Group in the CPP in North Ayrshire. So, as a result, the Health um, Inequalities Assessment Tool, which has a clear focus on poverty, is already used substantially by us to think about this. So, how do we build in the specific tools to ensure that we're all seeing things through a consistent lens? And then finally, we'll support families to maximise their income and participate in the life of the school. And it was brilliant to hear um, Gary's overview of the FISA work. We've um, started to recruit um, additional financial advice officers for um, schools in North Ayrshire, and we'll take that forward on a pilot basis, similarly um, to link in, for example, with our health visitors who are already in doing that work around employability and financial inclusion pathways. Could we move on, please, Hannah? Okay, so thank you, folks. So, um, in terms of where we are now and and what we're doing next, so the formalisation of this um, has started with the building of a network of cost of the school day champions. So they will be people on the ground, members of school, partner, and community staff, um, who will champion the the work and who will also participate in the annual conferences that Robert was talking about, as well as the cost of the school day network. So that will allow us to share good practice, agree actions and a sense of focus for the year ahead and ensure that partners are fully embedded in that. So we're currently in the spirit of co-production using the prioritisation from the Cost of the School Day conference to um, finalise the plan for the year ahead. And we're very clear about what some of the very um, specific actions will be and that they will be linked to the Children and Families Investment Fund. So we have £100,000 on an annual basis for um, food that will link into our innovative um, community food system and it will also um, allow schools to stabilise the provision of food for before, after and during school for the young folk who need it most. But interestingly, in that fund and in the clothing and the sustainability fund, we're going to take a participatory budgeting approach. So that will mean that we can um, share good practice through PB as well and also um, increase the amount of money that is available through PB to partners and schools um, by attracting funding from elsewhere as well. We've got a long history of PB in North Ayrshire, as you may know. At digital inclusion, um, we have an additional £250,000 over and above the Scottish Government funding from the Council um, for Schools and Families, and that will increasingly close that digital gap. In addition, um, we also um, are fortunate enough to have £350,000 for outdoor and residential opportunities to help our families recover from COVID, but also um, to build resilience in our children and young people. And we'll use that fund to offset um, access, for example, to our own outdoor centre, but also to subsidise the work that partners have done with us through the pandemic um, in order to make sure that the right families and young people are targeted. So again, um, thank you, Hannah, for the opportunity to do this. Thanks to Sarah for the support she's given us, and thanks to Robert for his leadership in North Ayrshire of this work. Uh, we're really excited to be able to embed this in who we are and what we do, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about it this morning. Thank you very much, Audrey, and to, to all the speakers. That was so interesting and a really a really wide range of sort of perspectives to, to come at this um, this issue from. We've only got about 15 minutes left for questions, but if the speakers who can want to switch on their, their cameras, um, that would be great. Um, I think we've only got one question at the moment from um, attendees. We've got, um, it's from Charlene Mitchell and it's for Sarah. And it says, Sarah, are you able to replicate the presentation as a CLPL offer for teachers and staff? 
as Charlene thinks it would be really helpful in terms of raising awareness? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yep, just uh, get, get in touch. You can arrange. That's great. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions, so I'll take advantage of this to ask a question myself. Um, it's around funding for, for this work. Um, Gary, you mentioned that the Faisal project was funded through a, a Scottish Government COVID stream of funding. Um, so firstly, I suppose, what, what are your, your plans for once that funding ends? And, and you know, on a similar theme in North Ayrshire, I'm interested to know how you how you managed to find the, the half a million and how you built the sort of political will and, and support for that. Um, and how, how might that be applied in other in other areas, do you think, in terms of finding that money? Yeah, thanks. Anna. Uh, actually, the funding uh, has came in two parts for, for our project. For the first year pilot, it was the Glasgow City Council that, that provided the funding for that. And that came about uh, through an opportunity. We used to fund financial education in schools uh, around through our, our third sector partners, uh, GMAP Scotland in the city. Uh, and, and that programme was was coming to an end because the, the, the officer that, that did that, that training for us was, was decided to retire. And that coincided around about that time, uh, we talked about earlier, we were having those conversations with community groups and we were looking at that data and it led us to, to, to try in this pilot. Uh, and, and very much like any other funding streams, we, we were at a cliff edge during that first year. We, we knew it was coming to an end. Uh, and this opportunity arose through this emergency COVID funding. But again, as you say, it's for 12 months. We do have a, a, a definite cliff edge at the end of this. We'll look at all available funding streams that we can get our hands on to, to try and extend the pilot. We are talking to and, and try to raise awareness of, of this project and the good work that it's doing to as many people as we can uh, in the hope that someone will, will take recognition of it and, and offer us uh, that, that availability to, to extend the pilot further. Uh, I suppose our great aim would be then to look at having serviced uh, those, those secondary schools in the city through phase two. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we're doing some kind of uh, preparatory work with a couple of uh, primary schools and an assisted learning school in the city, an event that we can take this program a, a step further that, that we can uh, easily move into to these areas uh, of the school. As you were aware, size is always a big thing in Glasgow. We've got uh, 139 schools, 70,000 pupils. Uh, uh, the vast majority of that is, is the, in primary school. So what, again, we'll have a lot of uh, really hard decisions to make as to if we can extend where we take that pilot forward. Thanks, Gary. Did Robert or Audrey have anything to say in terms of how, in terms of finding finding the funding for their work? Yeah, absolutely. And Audrey spoke a little bit about in terms of the, the kind of the non-party political basis of it, and there is some political leadership behind this work. I think there there, there definitely needs to be. So the, the five hundred thousand was agreed at our um, annual budget setting meeting um, at the end of February, when, we were, when all the councils were setting their budgets about like what what our priorities are going to be for the for the coming 12 months. Um, but I think one of the things I would say is really important in, in North Ayrshire, kind of, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of people here that won't know the makeup of North Ayrshire Council, but um, uh, we're, it's, we're a Labour administration. We've got 11 Labour members, um, essentially 11 SNP and 11 Conservative and Unionist and Independents. So to get anything done, there has to be a, a, a sense of, kind of agreement within that. And, um, it was mentioned a bit during the presentation. It was bringing other people from other parties on that journey with us as well and asking them the question of this and driving down the cost of the school day and putting more money in family's pockets, something that they've been involved in. And I don't know the council in the country that would say no to that, to be honest. So they did come on and they were really proactive within the um, steering group and the working group themselves and coming up with ideas. And um, so when it came to cabinet, there was no chance it was, it was going to get called in or anyone was going to disagree with it or anything like that because they'd been part of the um, the groups from from all the parties and you know, this is a real kind of um, real nice approach to, to that in terms of because not all of not all of our work gets to be so um, non political so I say non non party political so it was nice to be in a room with fellow councils where we were agreeing and we were working collectively that so that approach really really worked and was really really good to develop the plan the way we got it. Thanks, Robert. We've we started to have some more questions in, um, so I'll just 
Um, move on to those. Um, so as a few questions for Gary, actually, the first one um, is, have you found that by targeting secondary schools, um, you get a better, have you found that targeting secondary schools is better than targeting primary schools? Uh, to be honest, the, 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 we, we had a really tough decision to make in phase two about who we targeted. Uh, and, and part of that was, was based around the resources we had. We were very lucky to get additional funding to go from one officer up to nine. Uh, but equally, we knew that, that when we were looking across that estate, that, that we couldn't reach the whole city. So we used some of that, that data that, that I briefly spoke about in, in terms of, of making decisions about who to target. We had done that work with uh, our colleagues about the, the gaps in educational benefits across the city. And, and, and one of the, the biggest gaps we had was an education maintenance allowance with, with a 26% 20 gap in uptake in, in education maintenance allowance across the city. And that played a part in, in, in us, us targeting those, those secondary schools. Additionally, we used a lot of data surrounding uh, the, from the, the Scottish People Census that, that told us the percentage of pupils we had that, that, that were from a, a BME background, where English wasn't a first language. Uh, and, and what we found through that, that first phase, uh, with the, the pilot phase with those four schools, is that 70 per cent of the clients that came through the service were from a BME background. So again, when we looked across those the, 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 the school estate and all those, uh, the data that we had, we purposely chose those secondary schools based on the educational uptake gaps and, and that percentage of BME, BME pupils out there. So that kind of led us to that. But with an eye, an eye to the future, as I mentioned, we we're working with two primary schools just now to see if that there is much difference in, in, in that, that uptake. What we certainly found, obviously, is, is in, in terms of educational benefits, in terms of free school meals, that, that Glasgow uh, at the moment offered uh, free provision up to, to primary four. We know uh, that that will be extended to, to all uh, primary school pupils, but that presents its own uh, barrier, if you would like, that, that, that a lot of parents think, well, I already, the kids get it for nothing anyway, so I don't need to go and apply for it, not knowing that, 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 that it's, it's worth so much more than, than, than obviously what, what's available, that, that these uh, benefits link you into other, other benefits that's there. It's, it's about having that conversation with that, that experienced uh, welfare rights officer that leads to other things. And as I said earlier, that, that we, we'd, we've changed our, our approach in part about the promotions, that it's not just often about the, 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 the educational benefits that are there, but we're now actively and, and, and openly talking about other things like debt, about welfare benefits and stuff like that. And again, that's based on that feedback for parents and, and schools. Thanks, Gary. And sorry, Gary, we've got yet another question <laughs> for you. Um, so, yeah, did you have any statistics on whether you were getting sort of new and new, new, new and unique contacts through FISO in comparison to those people who had access mainstream services before? So w was it allowing you to access people that, that hadn't accessed advice in the past? Well, we think definitely uh, we don't have any concrete statistics. Uh, and part of this is, is, is surrounding data sharing. Uh, that, that, that we, we are in a very fortunate position at the moment that, that because of the fund we've got and, and the relaxations that are there in, in terms of G GDPR, we're able to share data really with, with our, our partners at the moment through the, the, the FISO project. We don't have the same levels of data sharing through mainstream FI. But what we can say is, as a kind of alluded to earlier that, that we, we knew from looking at the, the, the statistical returns that we get from our, our mainstream FI that, that and that work that we did we, we did some analysis in the Scottish Welfare Fund that, that, that two-thirds of the people coming through into these services were single adults we know children and, and we know already straight away with, with some of the numbers we've, we've had and, and, and I suppose we need to bear in mind that we had a really challenging period we we, we tried to kick off this, this pilot project in, in roughly about January or February 2020 when we engaged with those four schools. And almost as soon as we did, we, we, the pandemic hit, we went into lockdown. Because the, the, the idea behind this, this pilot was very much to embed that support in schools. It was face to face. There was an officer in the school where our parents were engaging with. And that, 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 this, the pandemic and the lockdown changed that whole dynamic. We were very lucky with the partners that we worked with, that, that, that they were flexible and, and we introduced new approaches. And we certainly 
have found that, that we feel that it's, it, we're successfully bringing those clients in. Don't get me wrong, we know that there's still a lot of gaps there. We know the pupil roles in the school. We know the amount of parents we've got in each of the schools. Uh, and we're still doing a lot of work to target those parents who uh, are, are maybe not willing to come forward for, for varying reasons. But we've spoke to a lot of those today, the stigma involved. Uh, the pressures that involve the, the the shame sometimes of, of, of people uh, in poverty. So we're trying our best, uh, to, as I say, to take it to the service to them through the school. And, and we found what we found, or we feel works very much in that is it's this named officer approach. So in each of these schools, uh, the financial inclusion officer is named uh, as much as this. There's a tagline of FISO for for the project and. and uh, whatever you like, but in each of the schools, the, the, it's, the, the message that's put out is, is so we've got a, a Faisal who's Sharon Graham, which she's a regional financial, financial inclusion support officer. So when the schools push the message out, it's come and talk to Sharon. And we've found very much that that's start to break down some of those barriers that, that the parents faced in the past where they didn't want to go to a local citizen's advice or whatever, but they'll come and talk to, to Sharon at the school. Thanks very much, Gary. Uh, we've got a few more questions, but we've only got about two minutes left. So any any questions that haven't been answered, we'll try and get back to you um, as soon as we can afterwards with an answer. Um, one of the questions is around whether the slides and contact details will be shared. Um, unless any of the speakers don't want their contact details to be shared, then, then yes, they will. Um, there's also a question about um, whether there would be scope for an opportunity to bring more uh, areas that are working on this together to, to talk about policy and practice. Um, it's worth mentioning that Public Health Scotland, uh, Julie Arnott at Public Health Scotland hosts uh, a network specifically looking at, at cost of education and cost of a, a school day. So I'll send out more details um, of that uh, along with the slides. Um, and it's also something that we can maybe take forward at the, the Local Child Poverty Leads Peer Support Network meetings that happen uh, on a monthly basis. Um, I think I just, just don't want to miss any urgent questions, but we have a lot of a lot of thanks um, to the speakers um, and a lot of comments saying that it's been really informative and interesting, um, which it has. Thank you so much for, for your time today. Um, and. Um, yeah, can't can't thank you enough, and I'm sure I'll be in touch to, with follow up questions for you. Um, and if anyone has any thoughts about what future webinars um, they'd like to see, then please do get in touch and let me know. Um, but on that note, I'll just end the webinar there and say thank you, thank you very much to everyone that's that's participated. Thank, thank you, Hannah. thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah.